back in like grade nine, I was not even thinking about university. Like it was just not on my radar. It was not something that I was researching about. Um, and then I remember I, in grade nine, this video showed up in my YouTube recommendations and it was by Kath Path, who was like a former student at Stanford who graduated this year. And she was basically talking about how she got into Stanford, what Stanford looks for in applicants and things of that nature. And I remember I watched that video and I was like, this is where I want to go. Like it just completely clicked. And I felt like it was the perfect place for me just from watching that one video. Um, and so from that moment on, I knew that this is where I wanted to go, but it was a very far-fetched goal for me because no one in my family has ever gone to Stanford. I didn't have any connections to any university in the U.S. So it was definitely like more of a dream, than like a goal that I was actually like thinking, like seeing myself achieve. Um, and also at the time I did not live in Canada. I was living in Iran because I'm originally from Iran and I've lived there for most of my life. And so um, I was living there and I was attending an international high school there where I was just studying like an American curriculum, but not in America. Um, and around grade 10, my family left Iran to come back to Canada and we permanently moved here. And that was when I started to become more active with extracurriculars because that was something that was not available in my school um, back in Iran and they didn't have many extracurriculars or if they did, people would be like very weird about it. They thought that it's really weird if you just participate in anything outside of the classroom. And so it had a very like different culture in terms of like being involved and wanting to do things um, outside of just like the scope of your own world. Um, and so I came to Canada and I started becoming really involved in extracurricular activities because it was something that I've always wanted to do. Um, and I knew that it would also help me with in terms of like Stanford. And I just feel like um, with my Stanford application, it gave me the confidence to do things that I always wanted to do, but necess like didn't necessarily feel confident to. So whether it be like starting my own projects or public speaking, these were always things that I wanted to do, but just felt too shy about. And I think that Stanford gave me like motivation and inspiration because I was seeing a lot of other students doing it. And I was like, if they can do it, then I can as well. Um, and so I started to become really involved in these extracurricular activities. I was creating my own opportunities. And it started with the book that I wrote, um, Roadmap to Financial Literacy, which I did in quarantine. And I like I wanted to write a book ever since I was in elementary school. And so because we didn't have school anymore, we were doing like um, asynchronous online classes. I was like, this is the perfect time to create this project. So I worked on that book. And after I published it, I was more interested in finance. And I was like, how can I make this education more accessible to students? So I started in Power Econ, and that just kind of sprawled into the extracurriculars that I'm doing today. Um, but specifically in terms of my Stanford application, even when I was applying, I was kind of an untraditional applicant in the sense that I um, I didn't take the SAT, like I registered, registered for that test and it kept getting canceled. So I never ended up taking that test. Um, I didn't have like a perfect GPA. I was not ranked like number one or two in my class. And so academically, I was definitely like below average at what Stanford admits. Um, but when I was actually applying to the institution, because I felt like it was a really good fit, I was super honest and like vulnerable in my application and in my essays. So um, I talked about my upbringing in Iran and how I used to be really ashamed of my culture and how much I hated my culture and I, how I grew to appreciate it because of the work that I did outside of the classroom through my extracurriculars. Um, and I talked a lot about with my goals for the future, how I'm interested in educational equity, social entrepreneurship, financial literacy, um, as well as like human rights and social justice. And so all of those things that I wrote about in my essays were just like very true to who I was, because again, I just felt like Stanford was like a really good fit for me. Um, and I applied early in November during the restrictive early action round because American University is offered like two times that you can apply. The first um, round that you can apply in is the restrictive early action for students who know that this university is their top choice. They definitely want to go there and it's a good option for people who are sat on going there. But then there's also regular decision, which is when most people apply and you apply a little bit later. Um, and then you can apply to a lot of different universities rather than just one. Um, so I decided to apply to Stanford early and I ended up getting deferred in December. And so what getting deferred means is that you're not accepted, but you're also not rejected. You're kind of on the border and they're not sure whether they want to admit you. Um, but the thing with Stanford is that they defer a very small percentage of applicants. So if they defer you, that means that they're seriously considering you. And so you have a good chance of getting in during the regular round. 
Um, and so for me, when I got deferred, I was like super excited about it. I was really hopeful because I knew that they hadn't just looked at my application and rejected it, but they had actually considered it. And so I kind of saw that as my opportunity. I'm like, this is the closest I'm ever going to get to getting into Stanford. So right now I'm just going to put in like 110% effort and do anything that I can to get in now. And so um, they sent me like an update form that was like very short, it had three questions that were each 500 characters, which amounted to like about three to four sentences entirely. But I just felt like that wasn't enough to like update them and convince them that I really wanted to go there and was a really good fit for the institution. And so what I did between the time that I was deferred and I got in, um, I wrote my admission officer a letter of continued interest, which was basically like an 800 word letter that I wrote, which is a bit longer than like what usually like people recommend. But I was just really um, like, I felt like I was really happy with the content. And I was like, this is one chance I'm getting, so I'm just going to like uh, keep all of it. So in that letter, I not only talked about what I've been doing ever since I applied to Stanford, um, but also what I saw myself doing at Stanford and why I thought it was such a good fit for me. So I talked about specific departments that I was interested in, the research that I wanted to do, and how I wanted to use the resources to do something important in the world. Um, because a lot of times when people are applying to places like Stanford and Harvard, they're always focused on like, this school is amazing. This is what I can gain from it. This is why I love the school. But what these schools are interested in at the end of the day is how are you going to use their limited resources to do something impactful in the world that's not only going to enrich their university, but is going to make the world a better place. And, you know, um, not only contribute to society, but also increase the university's reputation. And so um, if you're applying to schools like Stanford and Harvard, one thing that you can mention in your essays is, is like, how are your specific academic interests going to align with that university's offerings? And how are you going to use that to make an impact in the world? And so that is something that I talked a lot about in my letter of continued interest. And I think that was ultimately the reason that I got into Stanford, because I feel like a lot of my essays, um, they focused on what I had done and what I was interested in and just kind of my personality and my life and upbringing. But they weren't so much focused on like the future and what I'm going to do in the future. And so when you're applying, um, one thing that you can definitely do is focus more on who you're going to be in the future and how you're going to contribute to the world rather than saying here are the extracurriculars I've done like, here's my life so far you also need to have that forward focus and I feel like although I touched on it sometimes in my essays that was kind of what was lacking in my original application so I kind of thought about that a little bit and I definitely centered my letter of continued interest to be more like forward focused um and like almost all of the letter just kind of connected everything to like what I would do um, if I were to attend Stanford, which I think helped a lot. Um, and so for people who are looking to apply to Stanford, I would say that applying early is a really good option because it gives you that space where you're deferred. And I feel like people who get deferred, if they use that very strategically and reflect on what they could improve in their application and kind of make that improvement the next time, they have a very, very high chance of getting in during the regular decision round based on what I've seen. So that's one thing that makes Stanford like a really good place to apply to, whereas with universities like Harvard, Princeton, they defer about 70 to 80% of people who apply. And so if you get deferred, it's not much of an indication of whether they're actually considering your application or how close you are to admit or deny. So that is one thing that I really liked about Stanford. Um, and also kind of talking a bit more about my extracurricular activities and kind of what contributed when admission officers are evaluating applicants and they want to see who to admit specifically at Stanford, they look for what they call points of excellence. And this is essentially an area or one or two areas that you've really excelled in. And it doesn't have to be one specific area, but can be multiple and the more that you have it's actually better and so these can be things such as like being really interested in an academic field having an athletic or um, academic or just like extracurricular ability or anything that makes you stand out and shows that you're going to contribute to that institution and to society and so that is kind of how they view extracurriculars um, and then finally talking about my experience with school and my experience in the IB program. Um, I did the IB program because I'm an international student. And even though there are AP classes here, it's very like few and far in between. Like my school only offered two AP classes, which is not enough. And like they only offer it in senior year. Um, and I do know that if you're an international student, universities do prefer that you have done the IB program. And like the majority of people that I've seen get in as international students are IB students. 
Um, and so essentially, I was not actually enrolled in the IB when I came to Canada, because in Canada, you have to take the entrance exam in grade eight. But I talked to my school and they let me like come into the program um, in grade 10 because there was like this pre IB program that they were doing. And I started in grade 11 with everyone else. Um, and throughout the IB, I honestly feel like I didn't <laughs> throughout the IB, I honestly didn't feel like I spent much time thinking about the IB program. So like, I feel like a lot of times when students are in IB, their only focus is like the program and doing the assignments. And it's just such a big part of their life. But for me, I feel like it was always like a very small part of my life because I was more focused on my extracurriculars. And like my friends were always talking about all we had to do in IB and I was just not so focused on that. So I feel like I can't give many tips in that area because I it was just not something that I focused too much on. Um, but overall, I do think that it did help me get into Stanford and also made me a lot more confident in my abilities to succeed at a school like Stanford, because it was like a very challenging program. There were like a lot of different research papers that we had to write. And every time I came out of that, like actually producing something that I was proud of, it was like, OK, I can do this. Um, and so I feel like it can also be like an empowering experience for yourself if you want like a rigorous academic experience. Um, and so overall, my application, even though it wasn't perfect, especially academically in terms of like grades. I did not have like a 4.0 GPA. I got B's like in my French class like almost every semester. Um, I did not apply with an SAT or ACT score and I was not ranked super high in my class. Um, I was still able to get into Stanford because of number one, the narrative that I told my, uh, like told admission officers about the life that I had had, what I wanted to do in the future and what I was genuinely interested in, as well as um, the extracurriculars that I did outside of the classroom and the interests and the skills that they signaled. So that's a little bit about my Stanford journey, but I'd love to answer any questions that any participants here have. And I have love, I love the Stanford look. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, they can go ahead right now. Um, I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, so if obviously when applying to schools like Stanford, Harvard, or any of those, they obviously they have a lower acceptance rate and they also focus on the grades. Other, uh, but other than that, if you look at the extracurricular activities, do I really need activities like which I have to pay for? Like for example, um, you know, Harvard, Stanford, they all have these courses. And once you finish them, you get a certificate and they usually cost around 500 to 600 dollars to uh, join so other than paying for those activities is there uh there they also uh accept like free options like not free like in the sense i started my own organization or i did this or i did some charity uh so will they actually accept those or they want something you know where you have a proper certificate or something like that that's a great question. I feel like a lot of times people think that if they, they do a certain summer program, it's going to get them into that university, but that's just not true. For universities, these programs are not like selective to get into, and they're just a way for them to make a lot of money because I know like at schools like Stanford, Harvard, et cetera, um, they cost a lot of money to attend the programs. And admission officers are real people who are reading your application. And when they're reading that application, they're not looking at a list of things that you have done that they're checking off, but rather they're kind of, kind of trying to evaluate like your personal qualities and how that's seen through your recommendation letters, your essays, your activities, et cetera, and how those personal qualities help you contribute to the university and as a whole. And so they see that through the work that you've done. So if you join like a Stanford summer session and I don't know, you take like an economics class and you just put that on your application, that's not gonna get you into Stanford. But if you take a Stanford economics class and it totally like changes your world perspective and it makes you super interested in studying economics and you gain something valuable from it, then that story that you tell them about what you gained is ultimately the thing that could get you in. So they always care about that experience and you can get that experience through a lot of extracurriculars. It doesn't just have to be those paid programs. So like, firstly, I wouldn't recommend the paid programs. Um, and number two, I think that they would care a lot about charities and things that you create on your own that go out there and um, you know serve the community. And I know that this is something that's especially important at Stanford. I know that they have a whole class on like serving the community and things like that. And they say, um, you know, when you apply to Stanford, we look for your ability to save others, serve others, and like serve a purpose larger than yourself. So this is something um, that they do care a lot about. So for extracurriculars that I would recommend, it would number one be things that you 
go out there and you create on your own opportunities that you create. So for instance, landing a research opportunity, um, organizing an event, uh, starting a fundraiser, or anything that shows that you took initiative and you went out there and created something on your own. That's very important. And the number two, academic like extracurriculars are also really helpful. So if you can enroll in like free classes during the summer, or if you can um, take part in competitions or different academic things that signal that you're super interested in like economics, psychology, biology, depending on what you want to study. So um, number one, self-directed initiatives, and number two, academic extracurriculars are super helpful. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, so basically, uh, when you apply for a university, they obviously, you know, either they ask, they give you a couple of questions in your um, application and you have to answer them accordingly and do it. But do universities show a person who's applying empathy or do they just look at experience? For example, if, I, if I'm choosing to become a lawyer and if I say, you know, some, someone in my family or uh, uh, someone in my family has passed away, and um, hence I want to become a lawyer. So will they uh, show you some empathy for putting that or will they just look at your experience you've given them? Um, that's a great question. They totally care about like your life story and what has led you to want to do what you want to do because one thing that they care a lot about is why you want to do the things that say you want to pursue so if you say you want to be a lawyer there can be hundreds of people who say I want to be a lawyer but if you can have a specific reason as to a moment or an experience in your life that made you interested in wanting to pursue that path not only is it more convincing to them because they know that this is something that you're serious about but number two again admission officers are human they're like very young people who are reading your application typically they're like 20 into 22 people who have recently graduated college. And so when they're reading these applications, they have like real feelings and perspectives. And if you can tell them a story that takes them out of their day and gets them to connect with what you're talking about in like a very genuine way, I think that they're gonna be more likely to advocate for you because when they want to admit or select um, a few students to get in, after they read their applications and after they make their decision, if they wanna move forward with the application, they need to pitch you to a committee of like four admission officers who are much more senior and they need to convince those admission officers to admit you and there needs to be three out of four at least for them to say yes. Um, and so in that committee, when the admission officer is pitching you, they want to genuinely care about you and believe in your application in order to, um, you know, create a strong pitch that's going to convince other people to come on board. And one of the best ways to do that is to tell them a story um, that helps them connect with your application and also believe that what you're saying is real rather than just putting on a fake story that's, you know, trying to manipulate the system to get yourself. And so they want to trust you and they want to connect with you and they want to be able to advocate with you after um, they've read your application initially and are considering admitting you. Right. Um, I agree with the fact of, I mean, when you mentioned that um, admission officers that advocate for you, I recently had a conversation uh, with um, a rising sophomore at Yale University, and he also mentioned the same thing. I didn't know that, you know, uh, you, your um, admission officers, they read your application and advocate for you. But then when he was saying, I actually um, thought it makes sense. And now you're saying um, three out of four people must be convinced. So that's an incredible tough, I mean, like a tough job uh, to do, but ultimately we need to write a story that convinces them and helps them connect uh, with us. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like with Stanford, especially like I'm, I don't know the specific admission process at other universities, but it's very similar but with St Stanford specifically, they care a lot about like your personal qualities and, you know, who you are as a person and the admission officers, um, you know, do weigh that more heavily than like just your like hard accomplishments. So even if you have like a weaker extracurricular list or weaker like, you know, stats, um, as long as they're somewhere near what they're looking for, if you have qualities that shine through, they're likely to advocate for you and kind of neglect the little shortcomings that you have in their application because they want to admit people who are very compelling rather than people who are just perfect in every dimension. Got it. Um, yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I forgot my question. Um, but is there any other thing um, you could put in your application? You know, if you don't have a story, for example, if you just don't have a story, uh, like, not like a story, like you don't have experience. Like um, if I want to become a lawyer, like I said, someone passed away, it was unjustified, the, there was injustice. 
uh, but if I don't have a story like that, what else can I put in my application other than, you know, obviously your grades and your you know, past experience? Is there anything else I can put in there to convince the officers, admission officers? That's a great question. So when you're writing your essays, this is advice that I heard from someone else, but um, they said that the essays should either be unique or the essay, like for example, special or common essay, it, show, it should either show that there's something unique about you or that you have a passion. And so if you can write that essay about something that you are super passionate about, so for example, you're talking about law, you can say um, your interest in law, how it developed, how you started and how you were able to grow that passion, like whether that be taking local classes on law and like the system and things like that and being able to write an essay about that um, that would also convince your admission officer to get in because I've read successful application essays for Stanford like I read one of my uh, friends essays who got into Stanford this year and their entire application was about how much they loved um, the environment and how they grew like fruits and vegetables in like a farm that they had somewhere in Canada and their entire application was about their like passion for like growing fruits and vegetables and you know recollecting different types of like con compost and things like that and even though they didn't have like a super like emotional story about their life they had something that demonstrated they were super passionate and they were genuinely engaged in it um, and so if you can write an essay about something that you're super excited about whether it be an idea or um, a project that you created or anything that just makes you get out of bed in the morning and you care a lot about um, I think that that's also going to resonate with your admission officer because for instance when I wrote my letter of continued interest to Stanford it was all about like the things that I was passionate about and what I wanted to do at Stanford and my admission officer said that she found that to be like super inspiring on her part and so if you like I feel like in general as humans we're really inspired by people who are really passionate about what they're doing because it inspires us to like want to be passionate ourselves and put 100% of our energy into things so even if you show that you're super engaged in what you're doing I think that's also something that could resonate with and inspire your admission officer. All right I understood that thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed speaking to everyone here. And if you're interested in staying in touch with me, you can follow me on Instagram at Armita Hosseini, um, or like you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And I'd love to chat. Definitely. Thank you so much, Armita, for such an amazing session. And I personally uh, learned a lot about loans, mutual funds, um, stocks and everything. It was such an in insightful session. And I hope everyone as the viewers uh, found it insightful. And uh, thank you everyone for joining and for more such amazing sessions and events. Uh, do join Dean Chapters community and do follow Armita on Instagram and follow her startup, Empower Econ. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day ahead. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.